thank you very much mukul thank you so i think you uh, please uh, keep in mind that the time is really uh, very very precious yes so uh, i will and uh, just give me a moment i will try to just try to present what um one moment sir i'm not able to present for some reason uh guys is my screen visible uh yes. yes yes okay um i will try to keep this as brief as possible um i'm aware that uh we have not done justice to this topic in uh, <laughs> the thesis nor am i going to be able to do it here so let's go um so this is my overview i'm going to talk about symmetries i'm going to talk about something called global gauge symmetry local gauge symmetry reflect on what what the hell they mean and actually give uh, you guys my take on this topic so a symmetry is basically invariance under a transformation so think of a ball uh, now if you rotate it it looks the same in all directions and that is asymmetry so the ball displays rotational symmetry and there are a few interesting uh, transformation types that we need to consider so passive uh, a passive transformation is basically just the transformation of the coordinate system whereas an active transformation is the transformation of the object in question itself all right so uh, the other type of transformation that we should think about is a global versus local object so from your uh, reference frame if you are looking at a sphere and uh, what do i mean by a global transformation a global transformation basically implies uh, transformation that is a, a, a single transformation that is applied to every single point in that globe whereas a, uh, and it is same for every single point a local transformation whereas means it is different depending on the location um we model symmetries using algebraic objects uh, that are called groups i am not going to go in depth into this given the time constraint but i'm just including the axioms or the definition of a group for completeness uh uh as i said we care care about groups because they allow us to model symmetries and we're particularly concerned about groups that are called lie groups which can be expressed as the identity plus a uh, particular object that is termed the generator and uh the reason we ca care about lie groups is as uh, mukund was trying to allude to we care about something called the noether's theorem because noether's theorem gives us uh conserved quantities from symmetries and what do i mean by that a symmetry is basically in this case the invariance of the lagrangian under a transformation when i when i say invariance i mean something a little bit more liberal which means uh, the uh, transformed or the prime lagrangian can just be the lagrangian plus the derivative of a particular scalar function um in and uh, the transformation that i'm considering here is uh, you know my transformation is of the type q plus some uh, parameter uh plus my generator of transformation which is a uh, special transformation which is this guy and uh time plus some uh time generator uh of this type and this is my epsilon again so if i do that if i if it is invariant under this particular type of transformation i get a uh conservation law of this kind what do i mean by conservation law well if i equate this to this four vector i can sort of see that this holes which is the four gradient of this is zero always all the time this is what uh, nighter proved uh, in her first theorem and this is why we care about symmetries in the first place because differentiable symmetries because this is this is infinitely differentiable because if you look at this this is just the taylor expansion honestly uh, and you can get uh, you can get uh, you can go from this element to here by exponentiation uh, we covered this in the thesis a little bit um so uh yes this gives you your conservation law any differentiable symmetry of the uh, lagrange of the action sorry gives you uh, a conservation law or a conserved current and this is termed the noether current the jmu is termed noether current okay so i'm going to go through something that's called 
gate symmetry. What is gate symmetry? So gate symmetry is not a symmetry of space time. It, uh, like what we might have seen in the case of special relativity, which is the Poincare or the Lorentz symmetry. It is not a, uh, you know, a symmetry of space time, but rather it is a symmetry of our description. Um, and uh, you know, that is all that is. So uh, any gate symmetry is a symmetry of our description, which is to say we do make transformations in our description and that does not change things. All right, so I'm going to uh, take you to a vegetable shop uh, where we have tomatoes and we have apples. Um, it is in such a way that for three euros, uh, I can buy three uh, tomatoes and I can buy six apples. So each apple is 0.5 uh, euros and each tomato is one euro. And the key thing is I'm also allowed to trade between vegetables. So I can give three tomatoes and I can get six apples. Now, what happens if I drop, if my currency drops by a factor of 10? Does this change? The answer is no. My trade is still going to happen as usual. You know, I'm still going to be able to exchange three tomatoes for six apples. You know, the three is to six ratio stays the same. So this is an example of what is called global gate symmetry, which is to say, when I change a little bit of my description, my system remains the same. This transformation leaves the system invariant. So this is what global gate symmetry is. And I can sort of represent this graphically. You know, you can still see that the, the transformation laws have changed, despite the fact that the scale of the pricing has changed. You know, um, I, I will not go into scale symmetries. That is a, that is a more advanced topic. Uh, it was alluded to in the lectures by TRG sir, but uh, we will not go into it. CFT is a totally different story. Now, we can think of the think about this in terms of quantum mechanics, which the UN group was alluded to. So uh, what is the UN group? The UN group is all possible elements of this type, e power i epsilon, where epsilon is a real number. That's all. There's nothing more, nothing less. And UN is all of these transformations. So if I, if I, if I apply a U1 transformation, which is basically a phase shift, if I shift the phase of the entire system globally in the same way, you know, it does not change the expectation values. So we can sort of compute this for arbitrary operators. You'll see that, you know, since we're taking the adjoint here, uh, you know, you, you, sorry, the complex conjugate here, you would get a minus sign and they would both cancel out and voila, your uh, correlation function or the you know, expectation value, same thing, nothing. So this is a symmetry. This is a global uh, gate symmetry because this is a change in our description and this is global and this leaves everything invariant. Now, I'm going to show you an example in the context of uh, electrodynamics and for that I'm first going to formulate things in tensor form and the reason I'm doing it in tensor form is to make things easy in terms of index notation and I want to make it manifestly Lorentz invariant. So I'm going to define the Faraday tensor as a 0 2 tensor. Uh, don't worry about this. Uh, as long as you can read the matrix, it's fine. Uh, you know, a 0 2 tensor basically means it has uh, it, it has two covectors. Um, let's not dive deep into it. Uh, and I'm going to define something that's called a four, uh, four current. And a four current is basically going to be my uh, J0 is going to be the scalar one. And the rest would just be the vector uh, currents. And same for the four potential, I'm going to keep the first guy as the scalar potential and the other three as the vector potential. Now I can, I can actually define the Faraday tensor in terms of this. And uh, this is just a fairly simple uh, index raising uh, thing that's going on here. And in fact, uh, you know, we, uh, this is one of the primary reasons I'm doing this because it's easier to do things in this way. Um, and you can see how you can sort of lower and raise indexes and transformation laws become more explicit. They become much more easier to see where uh, these are pretty much any arbitrary linear transformations. Um, yes. Now I'm going to make an answer here. I'm not going to particularly tell you guys why this is. Let's just say uh, suddenly from heaven, we got this, uh, uh, for just from our minds, both are the same thing these days, uh, that we got this Lagrangian density here that is given to us. Uh, again, I have to make a comment about this. Uh, we are not considering any sources here. This is just a free, free, uh, free uh, electrodynamics theory, uh, free Maxwell theory. Uh, now, the thing is, you can extract the equations of motion right from the Euler Lagrange equations, which uh, uh, Rishi was kind of pointing to, Rishi Mukund were pointing to. But before we even go there, I'm just going to sort of transform the Lagrangian and I'm going to transform it. I'm going to transform a mu by a factor of this. And, you know, this is nothing but a real number and f is nothing but a real scalar function. Um, and for those interested in details, this uh, 
is uh, from this group, the general linear group. Uh, all I'm doing is I'm just shifting a mu by a particular scalar amount, and this uh, and uh, you know uh, this f is also the I'm also assuming that it is continuous uh, uh, everywhere. Now, what happens to the Lagrangian is what is really interesting, uh, or what even happens to the uh, Maxwell Faraday tensor is even interesting. So, uh, I've I've uh, missed out some. Uh, so, th this is the condition for gauge invariance. Sorry, uh, the condition is that this term is not changed at all, and if you actually work it out, you see that due due to the continuity, you know this this follows beautifully from Fubini's theorem, where you're able to change the measures. Interchange the measures. Sorry, so uh, you know you basically end up with the same thing. Your uh, your f mu nu is invariant. Your Lagrangian in is invariant. Voila, we've just uh, shown uh, ga global gauge invariance in electrodynamics. Now I'm going to talk about local gauge symmetry, which means the transformation, the local transformation. So for that, I'm going to look at. I'm going to take you guys to a uh, trade model between countries with different currencies. So before we go to the map, let me just show you a bunch of things. Um, so we're, uh, this is pounds, uh, this is the Deutsche Mark, this is the, your francs and liras. There are a bunch of transformation laws between how you can trade currencies between these different nation states. And uh, these are all the transformation laws. Now the question uh, you know, to test local gauge symmetry that I'm going to ask is can we change the currency rates of one of the countries and see if that alters the exchange rates, if it actually changes the dynamics between how you exchange currencies in the uh, countries? Well, um, I'm going to say yes, because I've kind of set up the system that way. But um, as you'll see, you know, uh, all I'm doing right here is I'm dropping uh, my L to L dagger or L prime, and my L prime is defined as L by 10. I'm dropping a factor of 10 for my L, which is the Lira, poor Italians, uh, they're undergoing some crisis. Now, um, you know, what happens is, if I just sub this in, I sort of see a one is to two ratio. And what I was seeing here is the one is to two ratio. My ratio is conserved, and therefore, even if I do alter one of the, the currency rates in one of the countries, my dynamics globally remains the same, which means my system is invariant. So I have just shown you there is local gauge invariance in a time order. Now we can take this to the case of quantum mechanics and see, you know, if I have a position dependence of my phase, does this happen? Well, actually, no. And the reason is you can sort of try to compute the correlation function again, but this time we'll explicitly choose the operator P and, uh, you know, your P is just to remind you guys, uh, minus i h bar uh, for gradient, sorry, uh, three gradient uh, for gradient uh, limited to the uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics case. And you know, if you actually compute it, it's not the same. It's completely different. You have a completely bizarre term, in fact. And the term is so bizarre that I forgot a bracket in the front. Uh, <laughs> sorry. So uh, what we have to do now uh, to make this uh, system uh, locally gauge invariant is turns out you can actually never make quantum mechanics locally gauge invariant. And you can only do that by coupling it to uh, a particular uh, uh, electrodynamic system. And the way I'm going to do that is uh, I am first going to change the derivative to something that's called the covariant derivative. Um, I do not want to go into details here, but it's just the uh, four gradient plus a coupling constant, which is just describing how well, I forgot a psi here, how well the psi couples to the A mu, how, how well they interact together, how well do they gel together, are they good friends, enemies, all of those things. And uh, A mu here, which is nothing but the vector potential, the four vector potential. Now, if I'm going to replace this, and if I'm going to do the local phase shift under this new derivative, you know, if I work it out explicitly under this brute force calculation, I will see that it actually works out to be the same thing. It is a symmetry indeed. But you have to see the ad hocness of the approach that I've just taken. I, I invented something totally mathematical out of my pocket. And then I assumed that we are having an interacting system between electrodynamics, uh, an electrodynamic system and a quantum mechanical system. And I basically cooked this up. So essentially, this local gauge invariance is only manifest uh, you know, in a uh, particular type of system. And uh, 
it, it's it's a particular type of setup that's called the RNA bomb setup, uh, where they were actually able to show this is a pretty important result. They were actually able to show that the wave function is a physical entity. It's a, it's an entity that you must consider. The vector potential is an entity that you must consider because it is capable if you think deeply about it to make local phase shifts if you just make changes in the AMU. You know, if you're able to just move things around. So anyways, that's a story for a different day. Uh, for completeness, I've sort of included uh, this thing. Uh, if you observe this carefully, if you observe equation two carefully, or equation thir 31 carefully, uh, you'll see that there is a coupling going on here, and there's a coupling going on here. And first thing to note is this is an inhomogeneous uh, differential equation. Not gonna talk too much about it, so do not worry. Uh, this is the klein coordinate in the LHS. But instead of zero in the RHS, we have some terms, so it's obviously inhomogeneous. But it, the inhomogeneity is in a, such a way that uh, you have interactions between these guys. You have interactions between these guys going on. Um, again, I'm not going to go too much into this, but I'm just showing you guys that this was a setup uh, that is very special, that we need to have these interactions if you want glo global gate symmetry. Now. To sort of re reflect upon the speed run that we've just been through, what I would say is that uh, gain symmetries aren't real symmetries because honestly, apart from the U1 symmetry, you know, uh, you, you do not have any uh, noise current that will pop out. You will do, you will not have any conservation loss. So it's not a gauge symmetry, it's not a real symmetry in the Noetherian sense. Um, and uh, these are redundancies, definitely so. These are redundancies in our uh, sort of explanation of the physical reality that we choose to explain. For example, uh, you know, the way we chose our gate, we chose a mu. And the condition for a mu, uh, which is called the Lorentz gauge condition, is of this type. We could have chosen an equally valid uh, setup. This is called the Coulomb gauge, for example. But we did not do this. The reason we did not do this, even though this is really, really valid, because imagine we're just talking about photons at the end of the day. We did not talk about spin. And you know for a fact that photons have two degrees of polarization. We do not need a four vector to describe two degrees of freedom. We have two extra degrees of freedom. Why do we care about two extra degrees of freedom? The reason we really care about this is, this is manifestly Lorentz invariant, naively when you look at it. Um, and the other reason you care about this is it allows you to systematically keep track of different descriptions of physics because I can equally talk about a, a four vector uh, potential as we saw earlier that is of this type. You know, um, and we're just sort of keeping track of all the different representations of the same physical reality and um, I would sort of conclude on the note, despite all of this sort of throat clearing that we've been through, I would take a very conservative outlook uh, in the footsteps of Wheeler. Uh, and uh, I would end with this quote here. Uh, a symmetry principle is not an end in itself. Group theory is very fancy, very useful for calculation, but it is absolutely no substitute uh, for physics. And uh, thank you, I uh, yield and uh, I believe I've my time very much. Uh, apologies. Uh,